Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Stephen Giesel. I'm the senior analyst with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And we welcome you to ITIF's events on how technology is reshaping the future of mobility. Whether it's advanced batteries, lightweight composites, or information technology enabled applications that facilitate automated driving with features like collision avoidance, lane departure warnings, parking assist. The future of mobility is being completely reshaped by technology, as incredibly well exemplified by Toyota's iRoad, an ultra-compact, convenient, urban electric concept vehicle that uses the latest technology and is a clear example of Toyota's commitment to innovate and create fun-to-drive vehicles that inspire people. The radical transformation that technology is bringing to mobility holds the promise to dramatically increase safety, improve personal mobility and convenience, decrease congestion and the environmental impacts of automobiles, and generate economic uh, increases in terms of uh, bringing more operational efficiency to roadways and driving economic growth in the United States. So with that, I'd like to welcome you and introduce Dean Garfield, the president of the Information Technology Industry Council, who will serve as our moderator today. Great, thanks, Stephen. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Toyota and ITIO, for co-hosting this event. Uh, before coming over here, I was talking to someone. They, they mentioned they get invited to tons of events in Washington, but this is one they were actually looking forward to. <laughs> for a second, I thought it had something to do with me, and then I realized I was really the car and the panel. So uh, we've got a great panel, uh, made of a really dynamic panelists. They have really impressive bios in that they all have multiple degrees. Uh, I'm not going to read or recite what you've read. I'll simply introduce them and read something about them, and then we'll jump into the conversation. So, We'll start with Andrew Kutzi, who's the Group Vice President for Product Planning at Toyota. Uh, Andrew has been working with Toyota for almost 20 years, and if you have anything to do with the iRoad, uh, job well done. Uh, we're also joined by Vita Sistani, who is the Director of Automotive Business Development at Micron. Uh, she also has been working in the semiconductor industry for almost 20 years. Uh, and has a background in electrical engineering that she has applied to systems and supply chains, which we'll talk about a bit in the context of the broader discussion that we've had. We're also joined by Mary Brown, who's the Director of Government Affairs uh, at Cisco Systems, otherwise known as just Cisco. And if you didn't otherwise see it, Mary was quoted in the New York Times last week <laughs> around uh, infrastructure issues, which we'll end up talking about today as well. And uh, before we get to Stephen, we also have Risk Ake, who is the Director of Marketing and Communications at IBM. Uh, he's won a number of awards for his work globally, in that he worked in foreign service in the Department of Commerce for joining IBM. And so we'll also talk about the global implications of many of the issues around the future of new mobile platforms and mobility. So with that, why don't we jump into the conversation and I'll, I'll start uh, with what I think is an easy question, which is, what is each of your, and we'll start with a vision statement, seems as good a place as any to start. So what's your, each of your vision for the future of mobility? And if you could say a little bit about what you're doing and what your company is doing to help advance that. I'll, I'll put a nuance to it when we get to you, Steve. Angie, you can start. We'll go this way and then I'll mix it up as we, as we talk about all the issues. Thanks, and thanks for having us, uh, for having me here. Um, you know, Toyota, we're, we're pleased to be able to bring the iRoad here today, but truly Toyota is investing in so many different areas of transportation. Um, we really do see a bright future. Uh, we see our role as helping to really um, lift up and improve the, the lives of our customers through providing safe transportation, through providing better convenience, 
And so uh, even uh, Stephen talked a little bit about issues like congestion and so forth. Um, we think that there's a role that we can play in helping to make transportation and mobility uh, safer, and more convenient for people. And uh, as such, we're developing a, a wide variety of, of uh, technologies. This happens to be an electric vehicle here to be shown here, here today. We've announced our plans to bring fuel cell technology to the market. You might wonder, isn't Toyota uh, making a gamble on one or the other? The truth is that we're investing in a wide number of technologies because we believe that's necessary in the future. That's just talking a little bit about propulsion technology, how we move vehicles or people or cars. Um, but in addition to that, uh, it's clear that technology um, being able to connect our vehicles is, is going to allow us to do a better job of providing information to customers, uh, to be able to deal with issues like uh, congestion, avoid congestion where possible. But also, um, I think the whole area of safety is a huge area you're going to see a lot of gains in the next uh, two years. We are on the brink of being able to introduce really a lot of very advanced safety technology that can help us avoid accidents. So, Speaking about, in terms of uh, social good, I think if there's anything we can do to prevent accidents, to reduce the impact of accidents, um, that's, that's, I think, a big, uh, big role for us as well. So, multiple things that we're doing, really, we see a, a cool era ahead of us in the, in the water industry. Thanks. Peter. Hi, my name is Peter Sistani. I just wanted to take a second and ask uh, and tell you about Micron technology. Um, Micron was founded about 35 years ago in Boise, Idaho. And the primary product was to was the memory component that was used in computers. And since then, we employ about 30,000 um, engineers across the globe. We have manufacturing sites in the US, uh, actually about 2,000 right here in the Nazis, Virginia, as well as other sites in Europe and uh, in Asia. We are actually number uh, five uh, largest semiconductor uh, industry in the industry, and we are the second player in the in, in, uh, in memory contract. We are actually number one in automotive uh, devices. And the reason actually we are here uh, in relevance to the automotive segment, if we take a look at where we were in, in the cell phone business about 10 to 12 years ago, that we purely have analog device, you know, cell phones and no cameras, no sensors, no ability to serve the net, um, probably for the Tetris or so. And then from there, now we're coming into this smartphone that practically is, is, is a mini computer in our hand. And all that computing power translated into more memory. Now we see the same thing in cars. 30 years ago, most cars, if they had fuel injection, they were considered to be very edge. They barely had any electronically controlled system. Now we see more and more cars coming with sensors and with all kinds of um, technology, uh, electronically controlled uh, uh, devices. And that means more memory. And uh, we basically are going to be a major player in bringing that to the autonomous part into market. Hi, I'm Mary Brown. Cisco, and uh, you're probably wondering why Cisco is up here on this panel, and it's probably many of the same reasons that Micron and IBM are on the panel as well. Um, we are a San Jose-based uh, company that produces infrastructure and solutions around any kind of IP connectivity. And if you've seen any of our commercials during March Madness or anywhere else, you'll notice that we talk a lot about the internet of everything in our commercials which is something we passionately believe in, that the world is undergoing a new transformation. We're at the beginning of it. That pyro vehicle over there is an example of what we're talking about, um, whereby we're going to be connecting um, things, people, data, and processes in completely new ways. And the transportation industry, we believe, is one of the sweet spots for that, uh, and one of the places where we will reap benefits um, as far-ranging as the safety concerns uh, mentioned earlier, environmental concerns, um, uh, and many others uh, over the course of the next decade or so. So we are 
very excited um, about transportation and connected transportation and connected vehicles, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. Thanks. Great, thanks, Mary. Uh, I'm Riz Khalid with IBM, and uh, you know, if you kind of think about IBM, as, and I don't think I need to do too much of an introduction of who we are, but if you think back just five years ago, and you know, you mentioned March Madness, and you, and you look back at Super Bowl and some of the big events that have taken place, IBM launched something called Smarter Plan. And then from there, we coined Smarter Cities and so on and so forth. And, and the whole vision around that has been around the broader economic mentality of a region, of a city, and, and global. So when we're talking about mobility, IBM actually launched a strategy around what we call CAMS, which is cloud, mobile, analytics, mobile, and, uh, and social, including security as well. And, and the reason we're focusing on that area is we believe there's a tremendous amount of opportunity that, um, that data-driven, actionable um, models can present um, for more safety, as far as public safety is concerned, more effective optimization of resources such as public transportation systems or physical infrastructure that has some investment in most of the jurisdictions. And some of, based on some of our engagements specifically around transportation, what we've seen around the world is that a lot of localities really are starting to position transportation or congestion or lack thereof as a key differentiator for them as far as economic competitiveness. So when you look at you know, U.S. as a whole, and then we, we, we have examples, everything from China to Singapore to, you know, south of France and Toulouse, where the governments are really stepping up and identifying and recognizing the quality of life and livability of a citizen is really where the economy is going. So if you make, think back just 30 years ago, most people, when they graduated from college or a master's, you know, they went to a city where you know, they applied for a job and then left their whatever they grew up or where they were living to go and move to a city where the job was. Well, that model's completely shifted, right? The millennials and the next generation now expect where they live is where they're going to work, meaning that where they live is where they're going to provide a tax base. Where they live is where the region that needs to be over, over time sustained and competitive. So we very much believe that the data and mobility and what's being driven out of that data is really going to help with the economic development policies of regions, the tax and consumption models which have been in place as far as offering up tax incentives are going to go by the wayside over time, and um, really are going to move more into from a fragile type of an economy which is a singular, you know, let's focus on the tax policy and offer up incentives from that perspective, to more of an agile economy where it's data and technology even when you started talking about the broader vision of mobility. Sure, thanks, Steve. And I should also encourage all of you to stay until the end of our panel, because at its conclusion, we are going to be raffling off the ticket, and the one lucky winner whom I will select will have the opportunity <laughs> to test drive the IRO vehicle. Uh, In here, not you won't take it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I wasn't eligible to participate. <laughs> So, you know, I think ITIP's vision is a world in which every asset, actor, and element throughout the entire transportation system is equipped with the ability to engage in real time and receive information from that traffic system, whether it's the traffic lights, the driver, the vehicle itself, or even the transportation planner. Uh, so that they can make more intelligent and informed decisions about how to engage in mobility. Uh, when you look at the new types of technologies, uh, such as what's called vehicle-to-vehicle, -vehicle or B to, that's B2B, uh, or vehicle-to-infrastructure, or B2I systems that are out there, uh, studies have been done showing that if we could deploy a nationwide intelligent transportation system, such as IntelliDrive, then we could actually be able to mitigate automobile accidents by 82% in the United States. And I think that's going to enable us to think very big as a society. So in fact, Japan recently announced its goal to become a zero traffic fatality society by 2025. And that's going to have incredible impact on human lives. When you consider that there are 1.2 million deaths globally and 50 million injuries globally from traffic accidents each year, 
Uh, even in the United States, there are 33,000 traffic fatalities a year. That's almost tantamount to a plane falling out of the sky every day. Uh, annual economic impact of $450 billion to the U.S. economy from traffic accidents, $200 million from traffic congestion. The types of technologies we're developing today are going to enable us to address many of those challenges in a more sophisticated way than we ever have before. And what's so interesting is the new thinking uh, about, uh, you know, for years we looked at uh, technologies inside the vehicle, like the airbags and the seatbelts, that can mitigate the impact of a traffic accident. Now we're thinking about deploying technologies like collision avoidance that will enable us to avoid traffic accidents altogether. And, and, and this is going to be profound for our society. One concern I do have, though, um, is that the United States is falling behind pure countries in deploying these types of technologies. Countries like Japan and South Korea invest more than twice as much as a share of their GDP in deploying intelligent transportation systems. Um, so for policymakers in the United States, this seems to be a <coughs> uh, Actually, I'll start with the folks in the audience, which is starting with Andrew and maybe Why should consumers be excited about this? I read a recent article about folks who are visually impaired being able to take advantage of autonomous vehicles, for example. I'm just interested in your thoughts. Why should consumers care and be excited? Yeah, actually, it's very interesting. We're finding a tremendously strong interest on in the part of consumers in advanced technology, and I think it, it, it's the whole spectrum of entertainment that they can get or access to be able to uh, live stream certain information uh, into the vehicle, or it's uh, advanced technologies related to safety. Um, we're finding tremendous feedback from consumers interested in certain new safety technologies like blind spot monitors and so forth. They sound really basic, uh, perhaps to a scientist working on something really far out and advanced, but um, consumers are really demanding these now. And we're finding in some cases a uh, weird challenge to be able to produce enough of some of these options that we've created for vehicles. So it's an exciting time. Um, actually, we're finding among higher income consumers an even higher interest in advanced technology. So we're having to respond uh, to that. Um, you mentioned um, autonomous uh, driving. That's one thing I would say that probably as an industry we are, uh, it's very interesting to see the tremendous consumer interest in autonomous driving. I'd say it's perhaps not exactly expected, maybe three years ago, five years ago. Something that's well, five years ago, if we had a panel on future mobility, it would be all automakers in most of these companies. Yeah, I think uh, just when we, I think you have to almost segment, and I think that's what Andrew was talking about as far as you know, the well-off or well-to-do consumers are going to have different expectations of what they what they get out of technology. But I think. Where the excitement really comes in is just the improvement in mobility as far as getting from point A to point B a lot more effectively. And I think that's when you're going to impact the masses is where, you know, you look at some of the studies that have been done by UTI and some of the other folks where economic cost to an individual or family runs, you know, 1500 plus a year just by sitting in congestion, right? So I, I think the excitement really does translate into the improvement Just a, a, a side story. The other day I was driving and I looked down very quickly to get something and the car in front of me stopped. And I happened to have a car where it would stop itself. And it stopped itself. And I, I would have run into the back of the other car. The technology is not there. So it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I had no repair bill. <laughs> So, uh, Vita and uh, Mary and Stephen, I'm curious about, you all talked a little bit about the technology and the infrastructure that's necessary to make this happen. Where are we along that path and what do we need to do to accelerate, uh, whether it's the infrastructure or technology or regulatory deployment to enable the things that we've been talking about? Vita, you can start. All right, so uh, looking at it from the memory perspective, so the job of the memory component is to store some sort of information for as long as possible in the most reliable way. And uh, we also have that available to the user as fast as possible. So that itself proposes a whole bunch of challenges. When you add that to all the requirements for the automotive industry, uh, the requirements
travel and reliability and so on. That itself is something that needs more time. We do believe as a, as a supplier, we are where we need to be. We have the right mindset, the right technology, and the world map and vision. However, we still need the entire ecosystem uh, from the car manufacturer to tier ones, uh, to chips and vendors, to work closely together in order to give us that big time designing those technology challenges of the future. So we just your, just to pull that out a little bit, is your lead time on the chip side or memory side distinct? For example, automobiles are rolling out right. every year, but they're probably planning 20, 20 cars now. Right. Are you planning that far ahead? Um, so normally our roadmaps, our products, come in from the consumer side, from okay. the standard side. And in that world, the cycles are about 18, <coughs> 18 to 24 uh, months. We still follow more too long, if some of you may know that. Uh, so therefore, in order to provide that affordability and the cost savings back to the customers, we need to follow that. Yes, in the case of automotive, our life cycles are much longer. But what we see in order to provide uh, saving and make some of these features and technologies to the point that they become adoptable, uh, not just in the high-end car, but also in the car, we need to shorten our development process to feel under pressure. So it's so I have a general answer and a specific answer. I think my general answer, um, harkening back to what I do in, in my day job, is um, you know we're at a time when the automotive industry is basically reinventing itself um, for the first time uh, since it was uh, since it was founded back in the 1900s. And um, when I think about um, how the Federal Communications Commission dealt with the advent of protocol technologies in the 1990s and the 2000s, one of the decisions they had made early on was they were going to approach it with a light touch. They were not going to try to regulate it to death. They were going to let innovation bubble up. They were going to regulate it where appropriate for, for safety and for, for very selective reasons. But they didn't approach it as you know something that needed to be stomped and squashed and, and put in a cage. And I think we need a similar approach here. To allow innovation to happen because we're very early days in this revolution. Um, we have connected vehicle um, uh, that will be addressing safety issues. We have mobility and entertainment issues inside the vehicle. We've got infrastructure connectivity issues between the vehicle and the road infrastructure. And you know, a lot of this stuff is still you know in the stage where people are sitting around meeting rooms like this one and talking about it. Um, do, you, do you think the regulatory approach now is too early? Uh, maybe too early to tell, but it's something I think that the Department of Transportation and the National Highway Safety and Transportation Administration need to think about actively. Um, my more specific answer is one of the things that we need to be thinking about to enable all this to happen is radio spectrum, because all of this stuff doesn't happen unless we have sufficient and the right radio spectrum available uh, to enable all this connectivity, right? So, um, and, and it's gotta be appropriate for the purpose. Um, so some of this may, the answer may be um, carrier LTE networks, some of the answers may be Wi-Fi, some of the answers may be purpose-built uh, spectrum for particular applications, but that, that's a far more specific answer um, for you on the Well, I echo Mary's point about a light touch uh, and one that recognizes that it's important to strike a regulatory balance here and, and to recognize that 90% you know, of uh, traffic accidents are caused by human error. Uh, so that's the overwhelming cost of traffic accidents. And the technologies we're looking at deploying here uh, will have the ability to dramatically impact those incidences and policy because I think we must always keep that in mind. I think there are two tracks, though, on which these types of technologies are developing. I think the automotive companies will develop the automated driving assistance technologies, they'll develop the driverless cars, and they'll need regulators.
leaders to come in with a clear legal framework uh, in which autonomous vehicles can operate, and we'll need them to develop common standards and protocols for testing and evaluation of those autonomous vehicles to certify their safety. So I think that's the, 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 the regulatory angle on, on, on what the automotive companies are doing. But at the same time, it's vital that uh, our policymakers also invest in deploying intelligent transportation systems where there is a government role in those technologies. So it's the government, for example, that deploys uh, computerized traffic, traffic signal systems throughout the country, uh, the rapid movement systems. So all the places where it's Congress or the states that authorize transportation funding, we need to increase those investments in ITS. And I think one thing we should ask Congress to do in future service transportation authorization bills is to ensure that they invest at least one dollar of information technology for every uh, four dollars they invest in asphalt and concrete, uh, so that we're getting this, you know, a, a four to one investment in these technologies in the future, and not always going back to the past and uh, simply funding uh, new research. Because it's by those types of investments that will bring operational efficiency for us. Yeah, no, and you could have, if I may, before you jump in there, along this, this line of the conversation, and raise your mention. Additional thoughts on what can be done by policymakers to enable these sorts of technologies being deployed. And why do you think it's happening so much faster in Japan and internationally here in the US? And you can jump in and any lines you want to Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not really a government policy expert, so I don't really have any uh, point of view on the uh, sort of light touch or heavy no. touch type approach. But from a purely uh, kind of an auto industry perspective right now, um, from my perspective, um, there is a role um, for some clear leadership from the government side. And I think that, uh, just take just take the vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure communication issue. I think we need some agreed upon protocol whereby our vehicles will be able to communicate. We do see, uh, many of us in the industry do see that as a, as a new frontier for safety. And uh, so supportive of investing in that area. But um, for us to go it alone uh, would not make any sense clearly. We need, we need to be speaking, our vehicles need to be speaking the same language as other automated vehicles. So I think that's a clear example of leadership. The industry could try and do it on our own, but I think it's a really great example of the role of government. And uh, so we're anxious to do that, we're anxious to do that quickly so that we can uh, move forward. Um, as it relates to other infrastructure, uh, Stephen talked a little bit about uh, us maybe not having quite the, the expenditure in this country. I think there are some examples. Today, in, in, in the U.S. market, as opposed to, let's say, Japan, we are relying more on private industry to develop network <coughs> information on the traffic or other systems. Um, you could argue those are business opportunities. There will probably always be there, but there is still probably a role for government in this. Um, I don't know what the best role is, but clearly there's a role for government to really play some coordination role. And I think, from our perspective, we're ready to, to see that role played out. Um, so, any just a couple of thoughts? Yeah, if I can just comment, I, I would echo Andrew's uh, comments that I'm not a policy guy with an IBM make my comments outside of that. But um, I think just based on what we've seen around the world is that you, when you look at some of the most innovative solutions that are being considered as other basic technologies, such as you know the Netherlands and Singapore, and even Stockholm at the early days, um, you know th there was one key driver, which was a very limited space in each one of those localities, right? Singapore is an island. Stockholm is a 1,500-year-old city. You can't build any more roads. You had to manage congestion. So those four factors that really did make the policy makers and the decision makers move in the direction of leveraging technology to really you know, provide everything from predictive analytics to where traffic's going to happen 30 minutes before it happens, something to do in Singapore to you know, simple congestion charging, uh, being able to you know, do that dynamic charging with an individual as they're driving to downtown Stockholm for <coughs> two next and more hours. Um, I, I think. But they're, they're, what we're seeing increasingly is, is that, like in France and, and a couple of other places, is that transportation is in fact becoming a, 
competitive depreciator as far as economic development, economic sustainability is concerned. And I think um, we in the U.S., even though we're you know kind of away from Europe and a lot of the other places, we still are very much challenged as to why a certain person, you know, under our construct of each state kind of fending them for themselves as far as you know where I'm going to live and where I'm going to take my tax dollars. I mean, you, you see the recent ads in New York, right? You come and locate in, my, in New York State, there's no taxes for 10 years. Well, you know, I, I, I think there is going to be an increased focus on um, livability of an individual. And I keep going back to that because I do believe that the networks, as they're becoming a lot more standardized and interoperable from a communications point of view, um, and, and um, as more and more you know, airports become a lot more aligned, I think individuals, where they decide to live, is really going to impact you know, what they're going to do as far as economic development is concerned. That's huge. And we look at the D.C. area is a good example, even though we have the, you know, the federal government here and we have an anchor, but you know, it's one of the most congested regions in the country. And I, I would probably argue that if we didn't have that anchor of the federal government as employer, I, I would suspect that there would be a pretty decent amount of folks that are living here that are forced labor because of the nature of the job. They would, you know, opt out to live somewhere where they are not spending two hours sitting on 66 from getting, you know, point A to point B each direction every day. So that's, you know, I, I think that's going to have a, a huge impact. So we looked at that question of international leadership in a report we issued in 2010 called Explaining International Leadership in Intelligent Transportation Systems. And then what so we you're saying we're late for this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the report we critically found that countries like Japan, South Korea, and Singapore uh, had deployed more sophisticated systems around real-time traffic information system, congestion pricing, vehicle miles travel system. And I think what those countries realized um, was that intelligent transportation systems were the 21st century equivalent of the interstate highway system of the past. Uh, this is what the future of investment in their country should be. And they set a vision, convened relevant stakeholders, spearheaded and invested in implementation. And I think that points some of the way to what we need to do in the United States. <coughs> in South Korea in particular, what they did was they developed four ITS model cities throughout the country. <coughs> and these had the next generation conduction pricing, traffic signal, uh, technologies and proved in, in real time the benefits of the reduced congestion and reduced accidents, and that created energy and buying across the of South Korea for other cities that want these technologies. Are so there, I think we should have ITS models in the US. Are there, are there cities in the US that are leading? I think what you find in the US, and welcome your uh, yeah. influences, mm -hmm. is th th there are pockets. Uh, San Diego, I think, is a leader in congestion pricing, vehicle miles traveled systems. Uh, Minneapolis is a leader in a lot of the traffic signals and route metering, but if it's isolated and sporadic, uh, more uh, than it is to you know, higher nationwide cases in the country. Same thing in San Francisco, you see a lot of uh, car sharing services and so on, but at the same time, uh, different number of CPI electric cars get certain discounts. And so it's encouraging uh, consumers to go down the path of, of that. So just actually just adding to what we discussed here is my point was that technology is available. The same technology is being used in Singapore and in some of these areas that the government has mandated some of that policies. In the US, we see a little bit lack of leadership and mandate, like my colleagues here explained. But the same technology is needed here, and we may be needed in some of those countries. Yeah, I think we were talking about the, the iRoad earlier and some of the challenges of rolling out in the United States, including the fact that it may be designated as something different in all 50 states, and hence the requirements would be quite distinct to me. Also, the drive in DC and Virginia for now. In general, in the tech sector, we don't want government mandates, but by the same token, it's, we want to see leadership where there's otherwise a market failure and a market gap. And so that's part of the balance that we're, that we're trying to drive. All of you mentioned data. Security. I mean, we don't usually think about data in the context of a car, but more and more we are. Uh, can any of you were inclined to talk a little bit more about that? And also, what are you doing to help ensure data integrity and security uh, if your company is working on that as well? Uh, sure. I mean, I can, yeah. I mean, clearly, I mean, 
data analytics and, and security is a huge focus for a company like IBM, as you can imagine. And, and you know, we've worked with a number of uh, customers or clients around the world, which we can't necessarily name, uh, but where we've actually developed out units, for example, that will go into the vehicles or unmanned vehicles to be able to, you know, collect that information as far as where that where that vehicle is traveling, how far it's traveling, what's the difference, and only for the pure reason of being able to predict out based on that information where congestion is going to happen so that government can make the decision of, okay, I'm going to offer up incentives for X percentage of individuals to take an alternative route, and here's the route I'm going to recommend it based on the information that I'm getting back from you know, this data that's being generated out of the, the, you know, the, the device that's attached to the bus. So I, I think, I, I, but I think that there's you know, something that the other panelists have hit on is that there's a tremendous amount of need for, there's not going to be one vendor that's going to be able to do everything. So the partner ecosystem is going to be critical. So when you look at you know one one partner that I don't see on the diocese here, I think would be like a telco, right? Every single one of us have a device. Every single one has a device that you know if anybody wanted to look, it's you know, recently proven that you can find out exactly where somebody is at a certain time. Well, that information when it's, it's scrubbed and, and put in a very neutral capacity could be really leveraged to make very intelligent decisions really positively impact an individual when it comes down to traffic predictions concerns, congestion management concerns, so on and so forth. So I, I do think there is an opportunity for collaboration across different industries and sectors to get this over about. So I would just add um, that uh, I completely agree with Bruce's view that there's not one vendor solution to security. I mean, when we look at a car like that, when you look at any of the cars you're driving today, it's a really collection of collections of computer systems at this point. And so uh, we have to think about um, cybersecurity and issues around security from the moment we begin the design process. Um, and when we have systems like um, infrastructure systems that, that uh, will help us along the road, uh, we have to think about security there. So security has got to be everywhere and it's got to be designed in um, from the beginning. And um, just to bring it around again also to the spectrum question, because these vehicles are going to rely so much on radio spectrum, we have to make sure that the radio spectrum we're relying on is something we can actually rely on. Um, radio is not like a wire uh, that you can plug into the wall. Um, it goes through the air and it's affected by other radio signals and other, other conditions. So we have to make darn sure that that is going to work as we intend it to work as well. So there's a range of issues that are going to have to be addressed. All right, so um, I add uh, the same same points as well. Uh, so likely today we, we are designing our memory components with a level of security in mind. Because these are the same kind of memory that was used in handheld devices. And there is a certain concern about personal safety, cyber attacks, and so on, and the content that you save uh, in your cell phone or other, other products. So, um, so we are designing our products with that security and with others in mind. However, I still agree with my colleagues, we need collaboration because we are designing based on what we think is needed. So we need that open and ongoing dialogue from uh, all the way from uh, car manufacturers to end customers to make sure we're designing. I'm not to, to get too deep on this, but I'm curious, just your sense of the ecosystem I know it's, it's fairly new that this is going on, but your sense of the level of collaboration and what needs to be done to uh, advance that. Uh, and then I'm going to come to the audience question before we do that and try to get a sense of when the IRO will be on the road in the United States and not just Japan. So before that, just your, your sense of collaboration and what we can do to make sure it's happening on a more sustainable basis. So just, just uh, from global perspective, we believe in, in Europe, we have a much coordinated effort among car manufacturers, even though they're competing with each other, particularly coming out of Germany, but, but when it comes to standards and what the future holds, they set that competition aside and they have an open and ongoing dialogue <coughs> and they bring that to, to us in order for us to design our products. We, we wish and hope and as, uh, keep trying to have similar dialogue with other car manufacturers, whether in, in the US at technology or in uh, other geographies, such as Japan. So there is some 
No, no, just problem. in general, in the products that you are thinking about, contemplating, conceptualizing. Roadmap. Yeah, there's very little about my job that I can talk about. Just a clever. I, so, yeah, I think you'd, you'd be quite impressed at the level of at the next generation of Toyota products coming out. We've talked a little bit about that. In the public view about the next generation of our of our products that really embody new electronic systems, new chassis, powertrains, and uh, I think you'll find the, that the breakthroughs are going to be quite uh, significant in terms of our next generation of mainstream products, not just the Priuses of the world and the Iros, but even the mainstream products that we have. So uh, I, I need to keep you guessing a little bit, but, <laughs> but uh, it's are we going to excite in this world? Will our cars <laughs> We have a variety of <laughs> Jensen-like innovations coming and available to be putting in your driveway. <laughs> Stephen has the answer. Go ahead. When Toyota is investing one million dollars an hour in R and D, our expectations are very high. <laughs> Good answer. All right. Do folks have any questions? Is that okay? Take a few questions. Here, I'll do my Oprah. Come down. Hi, 
Julia Piper with EDUs. Uh, I wonder if, in the context of the World Urban Forum going on this week, you think about cities and sort of touched on, but how is this going to affect the mass and capital in developing countries and how they're going to look at transportation, not just the high tech stuff that we're excited about here? How do you see this reaching um, people where uh, congestion could become an even bigger problem and uh, emissions become like a massive problem in the coming years? Great question. Are you talking about the car or just technology in general? It's about the car. In general. In general. I, I mean, I, we're seeing this in, in several places around the world. From IBM's point of view, we've actually done some deployments in China where, you know, the, the, the Chinese government, the local government's using uh, congestion data to actually predict that. So prediction is a big part of the intelligent transportation system that we're focused in on, uh, especially in the road markets. Not only be able to predict that where, predict that where congestion is going to be, but also being able to use that information to offer up alternative routes for people um, to get from point A to point B most effectively. And, and, and in addition to that, to leverage public transportation systems, there are schemes that are in play right now that, for example, enable uh, for payment of public transportation systems through a mobile device, right? So there's just other elements that are starting to take place that, that are actually happening. Anyone else? Our car package? We were talking earlier about markets where, particularly developing markets, where this car like an I really could be a significant hit, you know, whether it's China, it's China or India or any of those markets where you have these congestion issues and public transportation concerns. Yeah, well, obviously we have we have very, very different issues in uh, the developing markets uh, as it relates to transportation, not only the congestion or, or pollution issues we've been talking about, but um, the price targets of the vehicles, what is it that consumers can afford, what are their needs for the daily transportation, how large um, does the vehicle need to be in terms of the size of the goods they're transporting or the number of people they're tra transporting and so on. Um, from, I think from a longer term perspective in the industry, it's one of the reasons why we can't just rely on only one solution. Um, if you look at the U.S. Uh, transportation network and the typical transportation patterns here, they're quite different, and an internal combustion engine, um, which still looks like there's a lot of development you know, potential for that, it may make more sense in an environment here than it may make sense in a domestic <coughs> urban uh, environment somewhere else, where it might, might be that an electric uh, vehicle or a fuel cell powered vehicle might provide a solution for a certain uh, situation. I think that uh, the idea of car sharing or somehow shared transportation is a big question in developing areas um, and also comes along with the question of what those local governments are doing with their infrastructure. Um, one of the challenges perhaps in some of these developing markets is that the road infrastructure or public transportation infrastructure is not so well developed so that creates sort of an additional challenge. Um, from our standpoint, I think as much as possible, if we can bring clean transportation, the cleanest transportation possible that, that, we, that we can afford, that our customers can afford, and provide that in a, in a way that meets their need, affordability targets, and so on, that's, that's our challenge. But it's, it's, it is a big challenge and oftentimes very different from the U.S. market. Sure. We'll take a more questions if there are any. Actually, I'm curious why I'll offer this to the next person. With the natural gas boom in the United States, is that affecting how automakers, including Toyota, think about fuel? <laughs> I, I think the industry is fairly uh, fairly fragmented in terms of uh, natural gas and uh, whether or not that will be a, a, a big solution for many customers or whether it will remain more for simply fuel fleets and uh, so forth, and, and the jury's sort of out on that. If you look at even the uh, Detroit-based automakers, the uh, commitment to CNV is is fairly focused on a couple of different vehicles, or in some cases, to even an aftermarket conversion solution. And uh, at this point in time, given some of our other plays in, in technology, um, CNV is not one of our areas. Hi, Chris Hall, back from Mitsui. Um, I just had a question about the general regulatory environment. Um, 
Uh, Mary, you mentioned that um, the rate of spectrum would be a big issue. Could you talk a little bit more about where we are right now in terms of what some of the, the regulatory issues are coming up? I know there's um, discussions about uh, whether it would conflict with other, um, I guess, uh, spectrum usages and uh, wondering what the industry is doing to kind of educate policymakers and, and make a step forward on that. And then uh, just in general, uh, with the U.S. Department of Transportation, I know they issued some um, orders recently about rear view cameras by 2018, and then um, I think it was uh, just B2B the technology in general by 2016. Do you think the regulators are taking a good approach on this by focusing on specific um, kind of auto collision preventative you know, uh, regulations, or should they be doing a more wide approach to just encourage the, you know, innovation in the space? Um, okay, so I'll do, I'll, I'll try to do a concise version of the spectrum question, because I can take a long time. So there are multiple bands of radio spectrum that will be used with connected vehicles. And some of it is things like um, the same kind of spectrum that your mobile carrier is, is using, um, and to what degree do mobile carriers play a role in delivering data to a car or getting data from the car, right? So that right now is long-term evolution spectrum, and we're also in the middle of a big revolution there, because we're, we're allocating a lot more spectrum to those networks so they can really uh, take advantage um, of uh, high-speed data flows that may be needed for things like entertainment or potentially other applications in the car. Um, so there's those questions. Then there's the safety question, right, which is the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle question. And that is very short-range spectrum where vehicles are going to be speaking to other vehicles in the vicinity. Um, that uh, spectrum has been uh, designated here in the U.S. by the Federal and it sits adjacent to spectrum that Wi-Fi uses. The question in front of the FCC now is, is there a way to use that spectrum for Wi-Fi when the cars are not talking to each other? So if you think of a busy intersection where there's lots of cars all the time, that spectrum is likely to be occupied all the time. Now think of a suburban cul-de-sac at Wednesday night at 9 o'clock, and there's no cars. Could the spectrum be put to work when there are no cars present? It's a technical question. It involves a very deep dive into understanding how the radio technologies might work together so that the Wi-Fi could avoid any of the safety spectrum. And the, and the question, to at least to Cisco's mind, comes down to can we do that safely? Can we do that predictably and safely so that we never interfere with the safety use? Those questions will be playing out probably over the course of the next year, 18 months. So from ITAF's point of view, uh, we're pleased that in November 2013, uh, NHTSA officials said they supported efforts by automakers and digital technology companies to develop the self-driving vehicles and their announcement that they encourage research on these types of technologies. I think with regard to the promulgation uh, that uh, by 2017, standards would be announced for uh, a mandate for need to be vehicle to vehicle communication in cars. I think from our point of view, when you look at what other countries around the world have done, like Japan. So Japan has this thing called SmartWay, which is a nationwide cooperative vehicle to vehicle vehicle to look for such a system that they went in six years from conceiving to actually deploying at a national level. So their government didn't issue mandates for what car companies should be doing. They said, we're going to help convene the ecosystem, we're going to invest in technology research, and we're going to create a facilitator and enabling environment in which we can get these types of technologies to be deployed in the country. And I think, in general, that is the type of approach that I take, which is that policy makers are on. All right, before we get to our wrap-up. Yeah, Jason, <laughs> any final thoughts, party comments from the panelists? Anything I didn't ask you that you wish had been small in the past? Oh, I'm not that small. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> no one else? All right, well, you guys were really dynamic. You did an excellent job. And thank you all very much for being here. Uh,
I want to get in the car. I've already tested on my fit. <laughs> Go faster, go faster. Allow some connection in the double train reservation system. Is there any kind of mapping? Yeah, I know I've got this part of See, it's got that active leaning yeah. technology, yeah. so that actually leans in. I believe there's a. Well done. Uh, <laughs> 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 